in the conversation. At some point, um, while you were sitting as circuit court judge in Arnold County, yes, sir, were you receiving complaints about uh, poker gaming machines at gas stations that were owned by James Howard? Yes, sir, I was. And can you tell us what the nature of those complaints were that you received? It would usually be a very, uh, very poor person. They would call and say that, because, uh, you know, people in Harlan County or any other county in, in rural Kentucky, they don't understand the difference between a judge and a police officer or whatever it is. And I don't know if any of the judges try to go to Walmart, but good luck uh, in my area. My point is they would call and they would have messages or leave messages or they would tell you, catch you when your secretary is out when you answer the phone. And they would be crying that their husbands had gone over to the to gas stations in Harlan and put all the, the disability check in a poker machine. And they had no money to pay their electric bills and they had no money to pay this or that. And I would always refer them on to law enforcement. It seemed to be something that was going on continually, over and over again. And I felt, in regard to Canon 1, that I needed to report that on to law enforcement, that they had called and made complaints. And that's what I did. And so were they telling you these complaints you received about these poker gaming machines at gas stations owned by Mr. Howard? I don't think they specifically said Mr. Howard. I think they said, the quote would usually be, them poker machines is killing us. We don't have any money to pay our bills. I mean, something along that line is the usual complaint I got. And my, and my, my husband or my man or whoever, their daddy would be a phrase they would use, is blowing everything we got on poker machines. And the, you knew, Harlan County being a small county, small community, that these poker machines were located in the gas stations. That is what the complaint was. And, and, and you knew that Mr. Howard owned those gas stations. I knew Mr. Howard owned some gas stations, quite a few of the gas stations in Harlan County. And you knew that some of the gas stations he owned had these poker gaming machines in them. I'm trying to think. I know that the complaints came in about the poker machines. And these were the video poker machines, I think, is what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. I think there might have been a time that I did see one of the poker machines in a gas station, yes, mm -hmm. at Browning and Acres. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. And were these complaints you received, were they telling you a little bit about how these things were working such that it was illegal? Well, I'm not sure, Mr. Mando, but I know the governor did an awful hard, put a lot of effort into trying to get gaming legalized in Kentucky uh, when I watched it on television. I don't think it happened. And in Harlan County, poker machines, I really don't understand how you can play a poker machine and be legal in Harlan County. I don't understand that. So... In addition to, if I understand correctly, Judge, that in addition to uh, referring the people that were calling you to complain about these poker gaming machines to law enforcement, in addition to that, you contacted the Kentucky State Police about the matter, correct? Yes, sir, I did. I felt under Canon 1 I had a duty to report it to law enforcement. And you Just as if someone had called me and said a child's been raped or someone's been hurt, or like I would do. Yes, sir, I did. And... When you contacted the state police, you urged them to investigate these particular allegations that you had heard. I told them and I had numerous calls, and I got calls all the time, and it was my desire to report it to them. And, you know, if I'm getting and these calls all the time, I would tell them when I get calls. Yes, sir. All right. And did you tell the investigator with the state police that you uh, wanted them to look into the matter and that you wanted to have these poker gaming machines seized? The investigator. Now, who are you talking about when you say the investigator? State trooper. I'm sorry. I just used investigator. My understanding of the case group. officer was Detective Keith Hensley, who gave a statement that he had never talked to me about this other than to have a search warrant signed and a uh, uh, destruction order signed subsequent to the agreed order of dismissal. So, I mean, I don't remember ever having conversations with Detective uh, Saylor in regard to this, and he obviously didn't say it didn't happen. So, I don't. I don't. Did you have a conversation with the Jerry Bailey? Jerry Bailey was the captain at Post 10 at the time. Yes, I did contact. That's who I made the complaint to was Captain Bailey. Yes, sir. And during the course of that conversation, you wanted the state police to look into these complaints that were that you had been receiving from citizens in Harlem County. 
reported to Kentucky State Police. And I found the Kentucky State Police to be, be a very honorable profession, an honorable police agency that does their job well. And normally, when a citizen makes a complaint to them, or a judge advises them of citizen complaints, they investigate those complaints very quickly. Yes? All right. Well, if that's the case, and if they look into these and they're pretty efficient look into things quickly and you referred the complainants on to the state police, why did you call too? Because, as I said, under Canon 1, I felt I had a duty to report criminal conduct to the police agency. And did you, during the course of your conversation with Jerry Bailey or anyone else affiliated with the Kentucky State Police, urge them to seize these poker machines from the gas station? I don't recall telling him to seize poker machines from gas stations. I don't recall telling him that, no. Did you recall telling, asking him that they need to take the machines? I don't recall telling him that either. I recall reporting to him that I'd received numerous complaints. These complaints came in all the time, and I was reporting it to him. Um, that way I made sure that I could say, if somebody asked me, did you report these? I reported them to the head person at Post 10 in Harlem. Did you ask him to take any action? I reported the criminal complaints to him, and I would assume he's going to investigate those complaints. In the conversations you had with him, did you ask him or suggest to him that he take any type of action? I don't understand what you're saying, Mr. Mando. You're indicating. I just want to make sure I'm clear in terms of what you recall about this conversation or conversations with state police. And I understand you're saying you reported these complaints to the state police. Yes, sir. What I want to know is, in addition to reporting them, did you also tell them or ask them to look into the matter, to investigate it? I don't recall. If you're asking that I say, you guys better check on this, I don't recall ever saying that. I recall contacting Post 10 and asking to speak to the captain so I could advise him that these complaints had been coming in to me. Mm -hmm. The citizens had called often, and I simply told him what they had told me and reported on to him like I thought I had a duty to do as a circuit judge or any judge in that matter. Did you render an opinion to the state police that you thought these gaming machines were illegal under Kentucky law? I don't recall ever rendering an opinion to that effect. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I guess my position on, on that issue is, isn't it pretty self-explanatory? Is, are, are, is gambling legal in Kentucky? I'm just asking, Judge, what you recall about these conversations and the best of your ability to tell me the details of those conversations in terms of what you said to the Kentucky State Police and what you may have asked them to do. That's all I'm asking. What I recall, Mr. Mando, is reporting to the captain at Post 10 at the time, Captain Bailey, who's a very nice man, that I'd received numerous complaints. That's what I recall. I'm a, I recall telling him what the complaints were, and I recall uh, feeling relieved that I had made that Referral, now I felt I had done my duty. If there are other things that went on in that conversation, I don't remember them. And do you also recall having any similar conversations with the Harlan County Sheriff in 2008 asking him to look into these poker gaming machines? No, I don't recall ever having a conversation with Marvin Litford. Any of his deputies? I don't recall having a conversation with his deputies. Um, that's the reason I reported to Captain at Post 10 is because, to be quite frank with you, I felt more comfortable with the Captain at Post 10 than I did Sheriff Martin Lidford. Even back in 2008? Back in 2008. If I'm not mistaken, that's right around the same time period that the Sheriff brought Bill Ball into my office. So there was, there was, there was starting to be a little bit of uh, uh, issues with him at that point. All right. And then it's my understanding that uh, as a result of the investigation that was done, that Mr. Howard was indicted on a conspiracy to promote gambling charge in November of 2008. Yes, sir. And you presided over that case um, in Commonwealth versus Howard, correct? I signed the indictment in the case and I signed an agreed order of dismissal in the case, right. yes. So, yes, you presided over the case, correct? That's what I did, yes. Um, and did you feel at that point that there was any reason for you to recuse given the fact that you had contacted KSP about these gaming machines and the complaints you had received? At the time, the way I understood the rule is that that was in my official capacity as a judge if someone calls my office and made a complaint and I referred it on. I thought that's what the official capacity meant as a judge. I thought that's what I was supposed to do. I didn't have any long, in-depth discussions with these people about what went on, what store it was in, how much money did they spend, or anything of that nature. Mm -hmm. I felt that, that was part of my official capacity. And in addition, 
when the, the matter was presented to me on an agreed order of dismissal, signed by Mr. Howard and the Com Assistant Commonwealth Attorney Sh Sharif Gindi, uh, I really didn't see what the issue was in regard to the agreed order of dismissal. The case was dismissed, provision in it being that it be dismissed with pre prejudice and allowed to be expunged. And uh, I really didn't see, I'll be quite frank with you, I didn't see what the issue was at that point. And I, and I may be wrong, but I did not see the issue. Show you exhibit 19. Yes. Which is a certified copy of the records in the Commonwealth versus James Howard case. You can take a second page through those. I'm familiar with. It. Okay. And part of that packet of records, there's the November 17th, 08 order dismissing uh, the claims, dismissing the charge against Mr. Howard on the condition that the uh, monies in the machines be uh, forfeited and that the s machines be destroyed, correct? Yes, the agreed order said that, yes. And uh, that particular agreed order was entered in court with Mr. Howard present, correct? Yes, sir, it was. And But his, he was represented by counsel at the time, Mr. Doan, correct? No, I was not aware of that. You had no idea that he was represented by counsel? No, sir, did not. <clears throat> this hearing that you had with Mr. Howard... Um, was conducted without counsel being present, correct, for the defendants? Give me just a second. The November 17th, 08 okay. order. Bear with me just a second. Are you talking about the agreed order? The agreed order of November 17th, 08. It reads as follows. The November 17, 2000, this matter having come before the court and the parties having agreed and the defendant agreeing to forfeit all gaming machines, all money inside said machines, and all the money seized in above said case, and the, agree, the defendant agreeing to refrain from illegal gambling activity in the future, and the defendant understanding his constitutional rights and waiving his right to counsel, and the Commonwealth agreeing to dismiss the above style case with prejudice in six months' time if the above terms are followed, and the court being sufficiently advised that it is about ordered a judge that this above style case is dismissed without prejudice and that all game machines may cease here and shall be forfeited. Agreed to in distribution, James F. Howard and Sharif Gindi, Commonwealth Attorney's Office. Right. Yes, that's the order. I mean, that's my understanding was that he waived his right to counsel after uh, talking to Sharif Gindi, the Commonwealth Attorney, Assistant Commonwealth Attorney. And my understanding was Sharif Gindi, Commonwealth Attorney, drafted that order. Had you ever known Mr. I mean, you knew Mr. Howard obviously before that day, correct? Yes, I grew up in Loyal, Kentucky. Mr. James F. Howard is from Loyal, Kentucky, just like my mother, my father, my aunt, mm -hmm. my wife. Uh, for many years, James F. Howard was a, a person who had supported me in a district judge campaign and liked me years ago. And uh, yes, I knew Mr. Howard. In, in addition to uh, presiding over the case involving Mr. Howard that we just identified in November of 08. Uh, am I also correct that you presided over a case involving Commonwealth versus Wallace Smith and that you sentenced Mr. Smith? Yes. Right. <clears throat> now, uh, Kotha Hudson, she is a attorney licensed to practice law in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, to the best of your knowledge? I have no idea whether she's licensed or not. Right. Um, when she appeared before you in the Harlan Circuit Court, did you understand her to be a lawyer licensed in the Commonwealth of Kentucky? Mr. Mando, to be quite frank with you, I don't know if she had a license or not. Did she represent that she was a lawyer when she appeared before you representing clients? I'm not trying court? to be difficult. I'm just simply saying I don't know if she did or not. But now I can say this to you. She did come to court. She was brought in by the DPA's office as a conflict attorney to cover conflict cases in Harlan Circuit Court. And she did make appearances for people on occasion, yes. And it's my understanding that um, she was brought in by DPA. She was assigned the defense of indigent defendants who qualified for a public defender, correct? Hold on just a second. You asked me the question again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ms. Hudson uh, was assigned cases for indigent defendants who qualified for public defender on criminal cases in Harlan County. That was my understanding of what a conflict counsel is for DPA, yes. And it's my understanding that over the course of some time, particularly in perhaps in 08, maybe into, or maybe 09, a little bit into 08, that there was a problem with Ms. Hudson showing up in your courtroom. She wouldn't show. 
Absolutely. All right. And then let me show you what I've And not just showing up for court. I'd received numerous complaints from defendants who were incarcerated indicating that she wouldn't come and see them in jail, she wouldn't return their calls, and they're languishing in jail. And I'm a circuit judge with a 250, 260-person docket uh, trying to keep these folks moving as fast as I can while protecting their rights. So that's what I was confronted with with Ms. Hudson. Let me show you what I'm watching. Yes, sir. You recognize that order, Judge? Yes, sir, I do. Right. And that's an order that was entered in February of 2010 in the Harlan Circuit Court in which you have uh, relieved Ms. Hudson as attorney uh, in, I don't know, what is there, 15, 20 cases listed there, ballpark? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. 24 cases, what it appears to be, yep, looks like that's what it was, 24. 24. All right, thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Um, and uh, in addition, you instructed DPA that she was not to handle any further criminal cases that came before uh, the qualified for public defender in your court. I think what I told them was, and, and please bear with me on this, Mr. Mando, a lot of this stuff has been several years ago. But in regard to Ms. Hudson, I think I told him there was no sense in sending her back to Harlan, not to send her back to Harlan, to Harlan Circuit Court to cover cases, because she wouldn't show up. She was either perpetually sick, the roads were always bad, but all the attorneys from Bell County and Middlesbrough seemed to make it just fine when they'd come to court, but she was always snowed in on the side of a hill in Middlesbrough. Um, I have family in Middlesbrough, and uh, I've lived in the mountains all of my life. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, I relieved her of those cases because these peoples, these defendants, their Sixth Amendment right to counsel was being violated is the way I felt about it. I don't see how I can sit on the bench as a judge and comply with the canons of ethics if I see an attorney leaving criminal defendants, languishing in, get in jail, time after time coming to court and not showing up. And I felt that I had no choice but to relieve her as counsel and ask Linda West and direct Linda West, who is the uh, managing attorney for the Bell Harlan Public Defender's Office, to get me somebody up there that would represent these defendants so we could get their cases moving. And that's what I felt that I had to do in regard to this case. And it's my understanding, Judge, that you entered that order that we marked as an exhibit. Yes. Um, you entered that order without any advance notice to Ms. Hudson and without a hearing where she could present a defense or state her case. Is that correct? I, that's not correct, and I'll tell you why that's not correct. I told Linda West, the managing attorney down there, I don't know how many motion hours I've told her. If you look, and I'll, I'll do this when I testify in my side of the case, you'll see that Miss Hudson has a horrendous record of not just my court, every other court that she's been in, and even through her own employment with the DPA, of not showing up for work, not showing up for court. Warnings mean nothing to Ms. Hudson. In fact, the prior judge, the one that, that uh, hated my guts and uh, has no reason to try to help me out, he'd actually issued an arrest warrant for her for not showing up for court. I was faced with the position of, do I issue a show cause order, let her come to court, put her in jail with 24 criminal defendants, I put their lawyer in jail, and the only time that they get to talk to her when she's sitting in an orange outfit up at the detention center then they can talk to her, and then, after I let her out of jail, bring her back down there and put her out with these defendants to try to defend them. How do you think a defendant would feel about their chances of a fair shake in the criminal justice system if that's what I did? So the reason I did what I did was to protect the Sixth Amendment rights of these defendants, get them an attorney, which the public defense DPA has a statutory duty to do for these defendants. I can't have a show cause hearing if she never shows up to be there, to, to have a show cause hearing. And Judge Allen, I'm not defending Ms. Hudson. Uh, I, I'm not arguing with you about the rationale for taking disciplinary action that a judge has to take in order to run his courtroom. Mm -hmm. 
What I'm saying, though, is before that order was entered, did you give advance notice to Ms. Hudson that you were going to relieve her from those cases? And did you give her a hearing where she would have an opportunity to present her side of the case, yes or no? I gave advance notice to her supervisor, Linda West, the supervising attorney, the DPA. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. And in terms of an, the impact of your order, the impact of your order is that Ms. Hudson has basically been suspended from the practice of law in Harlan County. No, sir. That's not true. She's not permitted to, to handle criminal cases in your court by virtue of your order and directive, correct? She cannot do DPA cases as a conflict attorney in front of me because she won't show up for court. Mm -hmm. Now, she can go to Harlan District Court. She can come up there as a private attorney all she wants to if people want to hire her. But the DPA has a statutory duty to provide a defense for a criminal defendant who is indigent. How on earth can I sit back and let DPA say that they've done their statutory obligation by hiring an individual who will not show up for court, who will not defend these people, who let them languish in jail, how could I possibly sit there as a judge and do that? And my answer to you is, yes, you can practice law in Harlan, but I will not allow the DPA to not comply with their statutory duty that they are state funded to do, and this individual received a lot of money to defend these people and did not show up for court. I will not allow that to go on because the DPA is ultimately responsible for her actions because she's their conflict attorney. And I relieved, I relieved her as the conflict attorney not the DPA. And if you note in this order, I say clearly, it is ordered and directed that Honorable Linda West has until March 4, 2010 to appoint new conflict counsel for the above criminal cases. And she did, and she brought a fellow named James Wren in, and he is the most, uh, quite frankly, one of the finest attorneys I've seen practice in front of me. He's cleared these cases out. He's uh, tried a uh, rape case where an individual was acquitted. He brought out a social worker who was lying in that case, and quite frankly, it was the best thing could have happened for for, miss, for the defendants, for this individual to be relieved as counsel. All right. Mr. Chairman, may I have one minute, please, to confer with counsel? You may. Judge, that'll conclude my, Mr. Chairman, that'll conclude my cross-examination of, of Judge Allred. Uh, I would move the introduction of Exhibits 1 through 19. I would, Judge Allred? I would renew my objection to Exhibit 18 because of the confidential uh, dismissed allegations in the, the preliminary phase of this matter. Uh, so if he can either redact or take the cover page off, whichever one he would like to do, that's okay with me in regard to that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I may have missed Did I miss an exhibit? I thought I had 1 through 19. 20. You don't understand it. You don't want 20 in yeah. 20. It's 17. And I agree. We can take that cover letter off. This one. And, uh, 17. On 17 and remark it, if that's yes. okay with the judge. That's fine. I'm okay. Is, what about no problem? There were 20 exhibits discussed. Yes. Your order, okay, yes. I'm sorry, exhibits 1 through 20. I missed it. My notes weren't correct. So I'm moving exhibits 1 through 20. Can you read more? Yes, sir. Take your time. Exhibit 1 through 20. Exhibit 1 through 20. Yes, sir. Take your time. Judge, you read any other? You know, let me say this. Mr. Chairman, it's kind of an odd situation because I'm also my own counsel. Um, Normally, I would have got the opportunity to cross-examine the witness and do my exhibits in regard to this. I would like to reserve that right to do that until my case, side of the case, if that's okay. I want to make sure that's one of the reasons I want to go second as opposed to going first because, you see, it's kind of... But do you have a specific objection to any of those exhibits? exhibits? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking about that, Mr. Chairman. Um, Forgive me because I've been testifying simultaneously. Oh, 
Well, I would like to add, if I can, just one thing before I go in regard to exhibit number 19. Um, just a couple of points of clarification before I go. Exhibit 19, there's been an attach attachment of an order of recusal by me in this case. And the reason I subsequently recused was, in Mr. Howard's case, there was a motion to dismiss with prejudice that was filed. And by that time, Mr. Uh, Howard was part of uh, the allegations, I think, against me at that time. So I recused in the case at that time. But in any event, no, I have no objection to him going in with the, re with the redaction. Um, can I ask Mr. Mando something, though? Certainly. We'll admit then exhibits one through twenty with the redaction. Of the one it's already been taken care of. Taken care of. Sure. All right, and that concludes your examination of Judge Allred. It does. All right. Uh, who's your next? Uh, uh, I'm looking at it from a time standpoint. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Mando, how long would you expect your next witness to be on the stand? Uh, direct examination. 30 to 45 minutes. Let's take a quick break then. We'll, we'll break at this time. We'll uh, take a 10-minute break. Judge Allred, did you have something?